To interpret extended XAPS data, the oscillations above the edge are separated from the slowly varying parts of the absorption coefficient mu of e. This is often called background subtraction and is an important step in the, in the processing of XAPS data. Hi, I'm Matt Neuville, and this is part of the video series on using LARCH for XAPS analysis. Background subtraction is often viewed as a complex and even error-prone process, but I hope to show you that it does not need to be this way. In fact, the qualitative description that I gave that we're separating the XAPS oscillations from the slowly varying part of mu of e gives an important clue. And using that clue and the Fourier analysis that we've learned in the described in the previous video helps us to do background subtraction in a way that's simple and robust and with few variable parameters that we need to play around with. So let's start by reading in some XAPS data. I'll read in um, a bunch of spectra, the same sets that we used in the previous video, just as a variety of XAPS data of various types. So we'll read in this Athena project file. I'll just read in all of these, and we'll just do the background subtraction on all of these in this video, just to give you an idea of how, um, how that works, and then also a little bit on, um, on what we see from XAPS data. So we'll start with the the simple arsenic sulfide, we have our, we have nicely um, normalized XAPS data, and in Larch's XAS viewer, it does the normalization or starts to do the normalization sort of auto, in an automated way automatically. So it usually comes up with defaults that are decent enough to use, and then we can just go and click on the XAPS tab here, um, and this is a complex page is the same one we used last time for the Fourier analysis. And here we're just going to be focusing on the plotting section and this part, portion here called background subtraction. In fact, um, if we look at these oscillations, if we blow them up, we see that there's a nice periodic uh, oscillation above the edge, and that's going to be our XFs. So we'll start with, I'll just start with um, plotting mu of e and mu zero of e, that's the background, would often be called mu zero, mu sub zero, or, um, or bkg in, in these program sets. So I'll start with plotting with what it calculates as the background for the, in, the first, in the first pass. And it's this red curve. It's very smoothly varying compared to mu of e. So that looks like it, it did a decent job. If we blow up in here, you can see that it does sort of some odd things right at the edge, but further along, it's giving a nice smooth curve. So maybe the question you're asking is, well, how did it do that? And it's nice that it did that in an automated way. Um, if I bring up a second plot, we can bring up the chi of k that that, or the chi, let's start with the chi of e that that's extracted, that's here. Um, that's the that's basically the blue curve minus the red curve uh, is that chi of e, and you see that at the right at the edge it goes a little crazy and isn't very reliable. Um, so we're gonna we're also gonna convert that to um, chi of k, uh, change the change from energy to photoelectron wave number chi of k. Uh, so that's then this these oscillations, and again that's a nice periodic. Uh, oscillatory function. In the previous video, I showed you Fourier transform, so let's just go ahead and, and do the Fourier transform for that. We'll show you the, the, the window function. We multiply the blue curve times the, this red window function, and then we convert that to, um, to R space. Again, this R axis is the Fourier, co Fourier uh, complementary variable to K, it represents um, distance from the absorbing atom, but this peak is not at the near neighbor distance. And we'll get to that um, in the in a later video when we start to do some fab calculations and, and uh, analyze, simulate, and fit this data. But you can see that there's a peak at around here around two angstroms, probably indicating it, that there's a distance, an atom, a sulfur distance atom at a distance of about two and a half angstroms. And then, but not much variation or not much oscillation at higher, at R values higher than six and actually nothing at zero. And if you if you can think about 
um, Fourier transforms again, the, the portion at r equals zero is the lowest frequency component. So that's the slowly varying part. So what we want to do for background subtraction is to remove the slowly varying parts, or in reality, or in one way to think, another way to think about that is we want to remove the low r components. And in fact, we can just simply set a value, say, in this spectrum, let's just say approximately one angstrom uh, in this plot. Everything below that is background, and everything above it is signal. And that makes it very easy to then pick what this function is. Of course, the red curve is just a mathematical function. It's a spline function. Those are given, those have a lot of variable built into them, so you can make them follow uh, uh, any curve you want. So we want to make sure that we limit the, the curve so that it subtracts the smoothly varying part, the low frequency component, but not the x-axis oscillations themselves. So a value of about one angstrom is a good starting value to think about what that, um, for selecting the background function. So, it, so in this paragraph of this page, there's the energy threshold E0, and then there's this parameter RBKG, which is set to one, that's in angstroms, and that's the value that it uses to determine what that, what that spline function should look like. There's also a, a range, a k-min, a k-max, and a k-weight, because this does do a Fourier transform. What, what happens, to determine this function is that it picks a function, if, um, a set of variables to describe that spline function, and then it produces chi of k, then does the Fourier transform with these parameters and finds the portion of, of chi of r the, in the Fourier transform space and minimizes that below this value one, uh, one angstrom. So this Fourier transform is not necessarily the same Fourier transform you'd want to do for an analysis. We start at k of zero, for example, so that we can try to get as much as, down to as low as k as possible. We usually end just right at the end of the data range, or if there's data that is bad because of glitches, we'll often stop there. And a k-weight value is typically one or two instead of two or three. Um, we want to make sure that we emphasize the low k values when we do that Fourier transform. Um, so let, let's play with some of these parameters then. If I just change this RBKG to a much smaller number, um, let's try a half of an angstrom, then you can see that here the mu is a smoother function. It's tighter, it's more tightly constrained, and here in the Fourier transform, a little peak showed up at about a half an angstrom. In fact, it's the the rest of the spectrum didn't change that much. And you might even argue that, well, that probably means that it's okay to have not done a, a perfect job of background subtraction. If I make that 0.7 or 0.8, and then when I get to about one, it looks pretty good. Um, the danger, so, so making the value too small is usually not a problem. If I make it very small, say 0.1, um, then the back, this background peak that still remains is bigger than the, uh, the real peak of the data. But, uh, and so that, that's problematic. But if there's a little peak that's, that you can ignore, then it's not so bad. You can see that as I change the value of RBKG here, as I step up, that the result of the portion of chi of k that you would want to analyze doesn't change that much. And if I change that view from chi of r to chi of k, uh, this will be chi, k weighted chi of k, you can also see what that effect is, that there's some slowly varying part um, that seems to be, make that look actually pretty bad as far as background subtraction goes, you can see here, if I blow this up, this red curve is dipped under, and so that's that accounts for why there's this slowly varying oscillation that isn't part of the XAPS data that we want to analyze. In fact, that's the point. We want to get rid of any slowly varying part 
that we that isn't part of the signal from the to scattering of the neighboring atoms. So we can make our BKG uh, big enough, but you can also see that it's not that finicky. That if we if we get it a little bit wrong, we might end up with a little uh, ugly peak here. But that's actually not a disaster since we'll be analyzing the further out peaks. Where where it gets tricky or where it gets um, more more difficult to know is when you have an when you have an atom at a fairly short distance at one and a half angstroms or so, then you can start to eat in to this uh, to the main peak. The real danger is if the if you make this too big. So in fact, if I if I just keep going up, so you can see here the intensity. I'll I'll say that this is like a value that's pretty good. The intensity of this chi of r is goes to one point four in these units. Um, I guess I can show you that in chi of k also. Like the oscillation goes from pl about plus or minus one, and you can see the frequency. If I walk this up, so I'll just walk this up, and you can see that it hasn't done a lot yet. But when I get to about two, that 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 will that um, peak will start to get noticeably smaller. In fact, there's it two. There it is at two. And if I now we go look at the spline that it put through the VKG function that you can see that we're now pretty closely matching that the data all of the data here is here it is at 1.9 um, and that's that's clearly not not good um, and you could make this much bigger you could go out to even say I think you can go out to four or five angstroms and if I go to five angstroms, you can see that it that it tried to put everything up to about five angstroms to zero, and it did a pretty good job of that. And what's left is just noise in the data. If I plot the chi of k, there's oscillations, but it's just noise in the data for this set. If I make this say even even if I make that two, um, not twenty not twenty million, but two. Um, it's subtracted almost all of the real spectrum. So that's what you really want to avoid is is getting in, getting too far into the main edge. But you can also see that it's pretty robust, at least for this data set, against getting it a little bit wrong. And you might start to bleed into that uh, into that main first peak, but you won't do very much damage to it. So in fact. Just taking the default value of about one was pretty good. Um, and I would say it's better to do this step quickly and then assess it later on when in further analysis. So let's just try another data set. Here's some data for iron oxide. And, um, and for this data set, uh, we're going to look at another portion of the parameter space. So here, if we blow up again, that's the slowly varying oscillation. This is the uh, resulting XFs. Let's look at the chi of k data. Um, and there's this sort of swoopy stuff and junk going down there. So another thing we can play with is we can either play with, again, our PKG. So I can make I can make this smaller, and that gets that's clearly getting a little worse. Um, and if I go to 1.2. It's still not great, and it looks like it's going way off the rails at the high k end. So I'm just going to change the k weight to to two, and then make that RBKG be one. Um, and that looks actually pretty decent. If I make that one and that RBKG of one and a k weight of two, it looks pretty decent. So the main, the secondary parameter that you'll want to play with is uh, is the k weight. You can also so let, so let me show you this though. Um, so this data is iron oxide. So here's this is the iron iron scattering peak, and this is the iron oxygen peak here. Um, and you can see that the oxygen peak for this data set, and this is common for transition metal oxides, sort of is asymmetric and slopes down toward low R. And so you want to be a little careful because if I if I make that R smaller actually that's also still okay all of those oscillations there and i i now i'll switch to showing you the real and imaginary parts we're really looking at these oscillations here um, as the main 
And you can see that that, that isn't actually changing much above about above about like one and a half angstroms if i it's gonna zoom out again but you can see that this part of the oscillation hasn't changed much um, and the part that we would like not junky part there that we might want to avoid is is what's changing and that's because it's right at the place where the where rbkg is able to see or unable to try to remove from the xaps data from the when it does the background subtraction. So that also tells you that like when you're analyzing this data, we might want to we might want to use RBKG of one for extracting chi of k. And then to analyze the data, we make we want to make sure that we only start at RBKG of one and not start below that and make sure that we have these this portion of the spectra uh, keep in mind that that is background more than it is uh, oscillations that we can analyze. So another thing that we can try to do instead of k weight of 1 is to take these clamps at either low or especially high energy. And just this is just a weighting factor that's a multiplicative factor to try to weight that value um, at high energy so that the high energy range will be forced towards 0. That's still not perfect for this data set anyway. If I show you what that looks like, there's still this kind of big peak that's that's bigger than the than the iron oxygen peak. So for this data set, I would definitely say chi of or using a k weight of two was the right way to go. How how big the clamp is seems to not matter so much. Um, Okay, so let's go on to another data set because we're just going to go through all of these as just examples of what you can do. Here's some palladium oxide data. And again, the palladium distance is is very far out. It's uh, over well over uh, two and a half angstroms. Um, but the oxygen distance is, is sort of close. Uh, so we can do the same thing. We can look at chi of k. Here actually we have a lot, a lot of chi of a longer data range, it goes, data clearly going out to K of 15, and we can just walk down this RBKG parameter until it starts to obviously fail. Um, there it's looking pretty bad. That's a point 0.1. So that, there it's done a poor job uh, of background subtraction with that spline going, not having enough constraint to fit the curve well. And here is an interesting uh, example background that's a very smooth curve a very simple curve that goes through actually it gets the it gets the chi of r and the chi of k reasonably well except for that there's this low frequency oscillation again that's a low frequency oscillation that shows up here that really won't pollute the real analysis of these uh, peaks but we can make it a little prettier uh, by bumping up that number until it until it starts to influence the main oxygen, the first peak uh, here. And so some value around, around one is all fine. The, we haven't done any damage to the data yet. Um, and you can also see in, this, in the mu spectrum that there's this large dip and oscillation right at the, white, right at the first main peak in, the, in mu. And it's common to have a large first peak right at the threshold, oh, it's often called a white line, and then a big dip, and then the XOS oscillations really start in earnest in a way that can be analyzed anyway, that's not better interpreted as Zane's. Um, and here we've really uh, tried, to, it's really done a good job at trying to uh, model f to fit that. And again, so let's let's try that. This, this is a large enough data set that um, probably the K weight, I'm gonna guess, isn't that important? It doesn't matter which, which, uh, which k weight you use. You'll get about the same answer. I, that's that's I, yeah. There is a difference. Which one you like better is sort of a personal choice. I think at at this point, um, and in in our space, it hardly matters at all um, which one you which one you you use. If we look at so the rest of the data sets here, so that's two transition metal oxides and a sulfide, which probably account for 
most of the data that's actually interpreted. Um, so for metals, it can actually be a little both easier and harder because the first neighbor distance will be longer in in these uh, in most metal systems. So it could be a little easier to because you can pick an RBKG that's clearly bigger than one and still get a good result. So for here, for iron foil, for iron metal, uh, a, a very smooth background does a good job. Um, and there's chi of k, and that was a k weight of two and three, and k weight of one maybe isn't beautiful. You can try a k weight of zero. Sometimes that helps actually for some data, and you can play with the weighting factor too. Um, again, yeah, so there with a, a weighting factor, of, a k weight of one, there was a little peak that shows up that's not, that kind of looks a little ugly. Um, but a k weight of two, it goes away basically. Um, and for the B, that's for the BCC metal iron, uh, iron, and for the FCC metal like like copper or nickel, which are actually almost almost identical, um, the the values are are also an RBKG of one and a, a clamp or a, a weighting of one or two will typically work reasonably well. Um, so there's the oscillations isolated uh, and a smooth function going through. Um, and and very few problems in trying to get that uh, oscillations matched. Again, the, the danger is that if you make RBKG3 here, that you'll follow the oscillations and your most of your XFs will, will disappear uh, into, into the... Uh, uh, into the background, uh, so you really want to be careful and not. I, it's 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 nice that there's this physical parameter that's interpretable as a distance. Four angstroms is clearly um, not a good value for trying to extract the, the background. You want to find the neighboring atoms that uh, that go out to four or five angstroms. So you so saying that one angstrom is the distance to which you will start the the real analysis is, is a reasonable um, approach to take. So that's background subtraction. And um, we're going to keep going through that. And now we're going to, uh, that process for our, each data set as we continue in, in the analysis in the in this video series. Um, uh, I should say that because we've done a fit to these data sets, we also have for this data um, an uncertainty in that background, and we'll use that uncertainty in the background that we've extracted, the uncertainty due to background subtraction, when we do the um, the modeling of the data uh, with FEF paths. And we'll start talking about doing that in the next video. So if you have any questions about uh, background subtraction or XFs processing or what we've gotten to so far, please feel free to uh, leave comments or questions in the in the comment section below and we'll see you in the next video thanks